Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Angel Stadium. Once again, with everybody's attention, please join me in a round of applause in introducing and bringing up the president of the OC Forum, Paul Stover. Yeah, right. Thank you very much. I hope you all have been enjoying your lunch, but I'd really, truly be remiss if I did not introduce the chairman of Angel Baseball, Dennis Cool. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you for having us to your house. Now, at this time, I'd like to welcome Anaheim City Council member Trevor O'Neill to the stage. Trevor. Thank you, Paul. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Angel Stadium. Thank you so much to the event organizers, uh, the board of directors of OC Forum, and thanks especially to the Angels for hosting us here today. This is always a great event where we can interact with the team. Make sure you get some selfies with your favorite players, which reminds me, if it doesn't go on social media, it didn't happen, right? <laughs> Ready? One, two, three. Yeah. All righty. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Trevor O'Neill, Anaheim's newest elected city council member representing District 6, which is Anaheim Hills. I took off office in December and have been working hard focusing on public safety, particularly fire safety in my district, road and park maintenance and improvements, and economic development. And I'm doing everything that I can to make sure that Anaheim's economy continues to fire on all cylinders. And that includes finalizing a deal to keep the angels here in Anaheim where they've been since 1965. Yeah. We have so much potential in this location for additional development, and I know that we'll craft a deal that's a win for the residents and the taxpayers, a win for the city, and a win for the team. But guys, you gotta start winning some games because the Astros are just killing it. With that, I want to again welcome you to Anaheim, the current and future home of Angels Baseball. We have a great program for you today. And I'll bring Devin back up to continue on with the program. Thank you very much, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you, sir. Notice how we left the mic on so he could keep talking even after the reference to the other team. But you know what? Fans of Angels Baseball or for any team, it's like I always get to say here. Thanks for being a part of our family and allowing us to be a part of yours. And you're part of the family, sir. And to each and every one of you, we very much appreciate you being here today. Go ahead and fade down the music if you would. Ladies and gentlemen, we thank you for coming to Angel Stadium. We hope you enjoy your time and your experience here. And right now, I get to introduce a couple of people up here to the stage. But for me, one of the gentlemen, it's a very somber moment because it's going to be one of the last times I get to introduce his name. So... This gentleman is somebody who is one of the most remarkable people, respected people here at this stadium. Anytime anybody gets to talk to him, share a story with him, ask him for advice, it is absolutely guaranteed you will walk away, and I told him this, you will walk away a better person for it, 100%. He's an amazing father, an amazing career, and he's heading off on an additional adventure I'm sure he's going to mention too that is just an unbelievable and an amazing opportunity for this man to have. So ladies and gentlemen, if you would, please join me in welcoming Mr. Tim Mead. And now ladies and gentlemen, also sitting here with Mr. Tim Mead will be Tommy Listella. He's going to be talking to Tommy Listello a little bit. Afterwards, he will be opening up for some additional questions. I'm going to be off into the crowd. If you guys do have a question for them afterwards, please feel free to raise your hand so that we could get it on the mic and address the questions to these gentlemen right here. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, Tommy Listella and Tim Mead. Thanks, Devin. And uh, appreciate you reading that introduction just the way I wrote it. So thank you very much. Um, Pleasure to be here this afternoon, um, particularly to have Tommy Listella here. Before we start, um, really want, we want to get right into asking some questions um, that I have prepared and then open it up for you folks. 
But every time before I go out and speak, I always try to give something away because if you bomb thereafter, they'll at least remember the first two minutes. So Tommy's birthday is January 31st. I'd like to give something away to the person with the birthday closest to January 31st. January 30th. Tough to beat. <laughs> Come on up. <laughs> Dennis wants me to confirm. You have an Albert Pujols sign ball. I'll be real quick before we start with, uh, with Tommy. Um, it has been a pleasure to be part of this community. Um, more importantly, this organization for the past 40 years. And uh, for the new role, I will take the angels in my heart. Um, and I will be back and forth as frequently as possible. But this organization has given me the opportunity to, to go on this next endeavor, uh, which I'll start June 14th, take over on the 24th, and then uh, have my first induction later in July. So I, uh, I've said it many times to former players, former employees here, about once an angel, always an angel, and that's the way uh, I will finish. So thank you, everybody that I've crossed paths with, and uh, I look forward to, to more of that in the future. To my right is a young man. Uh, we've gotten to know each other since spring training when Tommy first joined us. Uh, every team needs an edge. Every team needs a blue collar, grinder, baseball rat. Somebody whose happiness, ultimate happiness, is playing the game. All the other peripheral things that go on are just, they're just kind of part of the sideshow. Tommy Lastella is that player. And he brought something right from the get-go in spring training. Worked and, uh, and kind of integrated himself with new teammates very, very quickly into a new system. He's been great for our department. Uh, he loves the game of baseball. He loves the art of hitting. Uh, you know, baseball today has grown so much that you have to be very flexible in, in the different positions you play. Tommy's fit that bill. And uh, I think when we ask him some of these questions, uh, what he's done in keeping this club to where we're at right now has been absolutely amazing. And not just a pleasant surprise, but a tremendous surprise for us. So please welcome Tommy Lastella. Okay, Tommy, with, with the June draft presently underway, what are your recollections of receiving a call from the Atlanta Braves when you were drafted in 2011, uh, letting you know you'd been drafted in the eighth round? Um, I was sweating it out pretty much the whole day. Um, on draft day, you're pretty much sitting there by the phone waiting the entire time. And uh, I actually had a buddy of mine come up to New Jersey with me, and we were just hanging out. I was a little too nervous, so we went and started playing uh, – Mario Kart on N64, kind of <laughs> to pass the time, um, which was nice. I didn't really have to think about it too much. And then uh, I got a call from the Braves. Uh, Billy Best called me and let me know, and it was it was surreal. First hug I gave was my dad, and uh, he was in tears. It was a it was a special moment. You grew up in Westwood, New Jersey, and played collegiate ball at St. John's in Coastal Carolina. Did you have the attention of a lot of scouts, and were you aware of it prior to the draft? No, no attention, actually, um, <laughs> which I think kind of worked in my favor. Ironically enough, it kept me hungry and working hard, but um, it was difficult, you know, when you, you do put in that, the effort and the time to not have it validated by the people who are, you know, making the judgments and, and uh, assessments and everything like that. So it took me a little while to get on Scout's radar, but, um, you know, I definitely wouldn't change it. Did that bother you a little bit? You know, you hear some guys play with chips on their shoulder or a chip on their shoulder because they, they weren't getting a look. Did that affect you? Were you cognizant of it? I'd say so, yeah. Um, you know, you go and you play with all your friends and you see other guys on, in high school teams and college teams and everything like that that are being recruited. And, um, you know, if, if you play well and among your peers, you expect you're going to be in the same boat. And for whatever reason, it just wasn't really the case for me. So it did take a little bit longer. And um, I would say that that stuck with me. And like I said, it ended up being a blessing because it pushed me to work harder and stay more focused and, you know, give up more vacation time for hitting time, which ultimately paid off in the end. So, How was that transaction from collegiate ball to professional ball, both physically and then emotionally leaving home? Difficult, very difficult. Um, 
probably the most difficult thing, honestly, was going from the metal bat to the wood bat. Um, I don't know anybody who's ever played with both. It is really difficult to hit with a wood bat. So I was hitting about a buck 20 after like two weeks and I'm you know, calling my dad like, dad, I can't do it. I'm talking to my brother, I'm like, I can't do it. I'm coming home. And um, yeah, it was, it was definitely an adjustment there. And you know, mentally, emotionally, it took me a minute to kind of get, uh, it's a grind going out there every day. Um, and I had to learn how to do that and being around a good group in the, the Atlanta farm system was nice and they helped me along. Is there somebody that kind of mentored you early on in the Brave system? Honestly, I wouldn't say one person specifically, but they did have a really nice group over there. Um, compassionate coaches, knowledgeable guys who have been around the game for a long time. And I was really fortunate the situation I stepped into. And um, the minor leagues is a little different than the big leagues in that uh, you're kind of all in it together. Nobody's made it yet. Everybody's grinding their way to the top. So everybody's kind of supporting each other along that route, which was nice. So you're, you're kind of all doing the 12-hour bus rides together and um, making the most of it. So that was nice. You talk about a bus ride. I mean, we all look at everything that goes on here, but talk about the grind of being a minor league player that finish a night game, catch a bus, play a night game the next night. Yeah, it's brutal. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's really, really difficult. And that's one thing I will say is that, like, if you do go to any minor league games, have an appreciation for the talent that's on that field. It's not just at the big league level. Those guys are incredibly gifted. They spend a lot of time perfecting their craft, and you know, plenty of them deserve to be at this level too. And they make a ton of sacrifices just the way we do. And like you said, man, the travel is really difficult. And a lot of guys have wives and kids and families and stuff that you know they don't get to see for the whole year. And it can, it can weigh on you. And um, you know, but like I said, in the minor leagues, you're all in it together. You're all grinding together, so it helps a little bit. You're traded from the Braves to the Cubs in November 2014. When we were in Wrigley earlier this year, I got a chance to see firsthand the relationship you had with a lot of those players. Can you talk about your, your overall relationship with the Cubs? Yeah, it was special. Um, it was a special four years. I. Uh, when the trade happened, I was pretty nervous, to be honest, because they were just loaded with young talent, especially middle infielders. I played second base. Um, so I didn't really know what to make of it. And it ended up being the best thing that could ever happen to me. I learned a ton. Um, veteran players over there, the general manager, Theo Epstein, and the manager, uh, Joe Madden, um, both very good friends and uh, keep in touch with to this day. And um, for me, it was, it was a maturation process that uh, was painful at times, but um, I'm really glad I was in the place I was and uh, had the support of all the friends over there. It was, it was a special place. What does that World Series ring mean with the Cubs, and, and what was that experience like afterwards? Surreal, very surreal. I mean, just being at, uh, I think it really hit me at the parade, what we had done and what had been accomplished when you look out and you see, I think it was like five million people or something that were, that were, it was like, I forget what, one of the largest gatherings in human history or something like that. But like, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm talking, there were like, as far as you could see down these side streets on Michigan Ave, like people who couldn't even see the buses from where they were, but showed up just to be a part of it and to, to show support and appreciation for what that team had done. You know, it had been 108 years um, since the last one and, and Cub fans are incredibly passionate and love that team and <laughs> they show up even when there wasn't really anything to root for. So to be able to give them that was like, it was incredible. You had 24 pinch hits last year, which was a Cubs record. Can you describe the mental aspect of pinch hitting and how you approached on those days you weren't in the starting lineup? Uh, yeah, it is a little bit different. Um, Firstly, my routine is just kind of pushed back. So, you know, when you're starting a game, you do all your stuff prior to, you're getting ready, you're taking your swings in the cage, everything like that. But for me, knowing that I wasn't going to be coming in until the sixth, seventh, or eighth inning, everything got pushed back. And then um, it really taught me how to uh, kind of condense my focus for the day into just like a little two minute window. Um, knowing that that was going to be my role, I, I wanted to be good at it and excel because it was pretty much going to be my only contribution to the team and a really good team and I wanted to have something to contribute so um, it helped me uh, like I said learn how to condense that focus and to not take a pitch off you know you're going in late in the game facing a guy who's probably going to be throwing pretty hard um, with some pretty good stuff so if I miss even one pitch you know it changes the whole flow of the at bat and that that's my contribution for the night which 
really sucks when you don't contribute anything for the night. So um, it definitely helped, and I think you know it's it's helped me come into uh, an everyday role, kind of taking it as like whether I'm going to get four or five at bats today, I'll treat them as four or five pinch hit at bats. Um, that kind of focus. Did you talk to anybody uh, about pinch hitting? You know, somebody, a veteran or someone, you know, who'd done it for their career. You know, obviously, we've had Manny Mota here in, with the Dodgers that excelled in that role. But was there anybody who kind of helped you through the, the mental part in preparation? Not so much with uh, specific to pinch hitting. Hitting in general, they had some great minds over there. John Maley was a really good hitting coach that I enjoyed working with. But um, specific to pinch hitting, not really. It was kind of just... Uh, you know, learning and adjusting on the fly, just trial and error for the most part, going out there and failing and, you know, making an adjustment, coming back the next time. And um, it is a little bit difficult in that you don't get the repetitions as frequently. So I could have one at bat and then I wouldn't be out there for four or five days, you know, if the situation didn't dictate in the game. But um, yeah, I'd say it was mostly just trial and error. Joining a new organization with the Angels this year, not only a new organization, but a new league. How's that been? It's been great. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the, um, the organization, I don't have to tell you, is, is top notch. And everybody here is um, very knowledgeable, um, helpful, supportive. Um, so it made the transition uh, about as easy as it could have been. And I think that's definitely helped me on the field. Um, and as far as the new league, it is you know, sometimes a little challenging not having uh, seen some of the pitching. Um, and played against some of these guys, but hopefully I'm getting used to it and um, the second time through I'll, I'll have a little better idea. Okay, for those who follow us on an everyday basis, the big question is talk about the home runs this year. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't really know what to make of it to be honest with you. I, I wish I had a good answer. Um, I think, you know, just getting to be out there and playing every day has helped. Um, getting to see more pitches. Uh, I never had a problem driving the ball. Most of my career in college and the minor leagues, I, it was never really an issue for me. I never had to think about it. But pinch hitting is kind of one of those things where it's uh, it's more of a take what you can get type of role. So I'm I'm not necessarily looking to jump somebody in in the gap um, in the eighth inning. You know, against a guy throwing really hard, I'm looking to take whatever he gives me. And if it's a base hit to left field, so be it. You know, that's a win. But um, I think being out there more consistently has helped me uh, just get the repetitions and remember how I used to go about approaching four or five at bats for a game. What's your assessment of the season so far? I think it's pretty good. I mean, I don't, I don't, you know, obviously he was kind of hammering on us about the Astros, but uh, <laughs> but uh, they're a really good team, and we have a really good team too. And I think uh, in the beginning we were up against it a little bit. I think we were hitting some balls hard, and not much to show for it. But um, we're getting some pitching back too. I mean, Heaney's been awesome, and I think things are, you know, they're starting to turn around for us. And then we'll get Jay up back here pretty soon. So I like it. How would you describe Tommy Lastella, the person? The person. Um, I, would, I would hope somewhat helpful to people. I, I would hope I contribute something on that level. Um, maybe, maybe curious. I like learning about stuff. And I like listening to people talk, um, especially about stuff that they're passionate about. I don't think there's anything cooler than listening to somebody, whatever it is, talk about their passion and hear it in their voice. And, those are the people who usually have the most to say and the most information on it. So I enjoy that. I enjoy listening. And how about the player? Um, hopefully a little bit of everything. Um, I like to think that, you know, while the home run totals have been up, I don't necessarily think that's just my game. I like to think hopefully I can be on base for the guys like Trout and Pujols and Otani who are going to be consistently driving the ball over the fence. and. Be on base for them, play solid defense, run the base as well, and you know, hopefully score some runs. Favorite team and favorite player growing up? Favorite team have to be the Yankees. Uh, I grew up like, <laughs> I know, I know, I'm sorry. I grew up like 15 minutes from the stadium, so that's why. And uh, <laughs> big Derek Jeter fan, that was my guy. He, uh, I think the way he carried himself, um, the example he set for me as a kid, uh, the way he handled New York, the media, everything. Um, really effortless and graceful. Ton of clutch hits his whole career. Won a ton um, on a bunch of great teams. So I'd have to say Jeter. Your father's had a profound influence on you. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, my dad's, he's the best. Um, 
he always set such a good example, my dad and my mom, for uh, me and my brother and sister growing up. And um, went to medical school. We were talking about this. Went to medical school at 29 years old. So he was, you know, kind of a late bloomer in that. But you know, he believed in it and he wanted to go experience it, and he did. And um, he always instilled that type of stuff in us. And, and to follow what you know, chase down what you're passionate about, and um, to believe in yourself. And it doesn't always have to come right away. But you know, if you put in the hard work, it'll be there. This time we'd like to open up for some questions. If you can wait for the mic from Devin, and uh, please feel free. So if you could, we're gonna have everybody, if uh, you want to speak to raise your hand, we'll come over to you, try to get the mic to you, and then uh, direct your question to these gentlemen. Thanks a lot to both of you. First of all, Tim, you're so humble. Like for those of you that don't know, Tim's not just taking another job, he's actually accepting the honor to be the president of Baseball Hall of Fame. So congratulations, <laughs> Tim. Tim. Um, I had a, a quick question, Tommy. Congratulations on a great uh, season. A diehard Angel fan, you were like, who's this La Stella guy? And you uh, have been rocking. A couple weeks ago, you were ahead in RBIs, uh, runs batted in, and home runs against this other guy named Trout on our team. Do you guys, my question is, do you guys kid each other? Do you, is there competition? How is all that, that all going down amongst the players? Yeah, I'd say we definitely kid each other, but as far as competition, probably not much. <laughs> I enjoy it while I can. I mean, He's, he's a completely different breed, obviously. I'm not telling you guys anything you don't know, but um, yeah, we definitely have some fun with it. Me, Cole, Mike, yeah, it's, it's been a blast. All right, we have our next question right here. Is uh, Shohei Otani speaking some English around the clubhouse now? Yes, definitely. <laughs> a lot, and a lot more than I realized, so I gotta start engaging him more face-to-face -face instead of going through eBay, because he knows a ton. You spent good time and interest in the minor leagues and then to majors. Uh, Doug DeSense was an all-star major league player. His son Steve, I don't know if you know that, spent eight years in the minors. What percent of the minors actually get into the major? That's a good question. I don't know that one, do you? You've seen it from everywhere between one and out of every 36, one out of every 45. Wow. It's, it's, it's very, very difficult. Um, you know, we had almost... I think it was about 195 players in minor league camp. Uh, and then you start to, to break down the number of players that actually will come up through our own farm system. It's very, very difficult. And, and there are fewer players playing in minor league systems today than there used to be. So it's a, it's a challenge. Uh, the game is skewering younger now. So, I mean, if, if you, uh, you know, this June draft will be important. You start to read some names of some players that they think could be up in two to three years because the game's evolving. But it is, it is a grind. It's difficult. And I think some of them through the, through the years as the guys you get to know, the physical talents are there, but sometimes the emotional and the mental part of the game and the minor league system and that grind is very difficult. I'd tell you, 1995, when I was the assistant general manager, I did a, a study of the all-star teams for both leagues that year. The average time in the minor leagues was five and a half years for all-stars. So you just do that for guys who come up and then you forget the other ones that just, just never see it. Yeah, real quick question. I read with interest the Orange County Business Journal feature on Mike Trout, and at the end, they mentioned that the sponsor or endorsements of pro uh, players, baseball happens to be the lowest of all. Is there a reason or rationale behind that? It's a good question. To be honest with you, I don't know. I don't know how um, accessible some of our guys make themselves to that type of promotion. I, re I really don't know. Um, I know the game is uh, people in, in charge are, are making a push so that that's not the case because I think there is, um, you know, we do need to connect, especially to the younger fan base. I think I heard a stat, something about the 10 years ago, the average MLB fan was like a 50-year-old male, and like 10 years later, it's a 60-year-old male, something like that. So, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's thanks, tough. Tommy. Uh, sorry, <laughs> but it, it is tough because what it says is we're not, con you know, we're not connecting to the younger fan base, and you know, while it might not be an issue now, you fast forward, you know, 10, 15, 20 years down the road, um, we could be looking at an issue. So I agree. I think it's something that we really do need to get into. The other thing you look at is the NBA has the shoe companies and do a lot of the self-promotion. You really don't know a lot of hockey players for the most part outside of the stars. In the NFL, you don't see a lot of commercials on defensive backs and offensive linemen. You'll see running backs, you know, quarterbacks and, and receivers. 
So it's also fewer games. We're a game of, of who fails the least, you know, ultimately. So you can't build something around, you know, Mike Trout, believe it or not, has had a slump periodically, not, not too frequently. But the greatest of the greats in this game um, have failure. I mean, you really don't look at that with the other sports as much as you do in this game. And I think it's not just that the baseball doesn't promote it. I know we do. We work very hard as an organization. And Park Avenue is working hard on it as well. But if you take Aaron Rodgers, you're going to look at Aaron Rodgers over the course of 16 games for getting the preseason. It's tough to look at somebody over 162. Um, other sports have time on their hands that our players simply don't. We play 162 games in 183 days. And it's a grind to get guys to do a lot of things because that thing called sleep is very, very important to them. So I think if you, you know, what we went through with Mike Trout last year, a lot of people talk about Mike not being promoted. Mike Trout is who Mike Trout is. Sometimes it's what other people think he should be or want him to be. But he has two and a half million followers on, on Twitter. He does things his way. He doesn't need to go out and... You know, Mike turns down, he and his agent turn down promotions and endorsements every month, every week. Okay, so, but yet he does a spring training or a major league commercial every spring training and is always a go-to guy for him. So I think sometimes we, we get caught up in that top 50 athletes, but this game is, this game is still doing very, very well. Um, I know you just came back from a kind of a grueling road trip. You covered a lot of miles. And I'm just curious how you and your teammates, when you leave, uh, say, Seattle on Sunday night and go to Chicago, probably the wee hours of the morning, play a game, come back here, how do you deal with the fatigue? Um, um, I know when I have to travel all night and just have to go to a simple meeting, I'm, I'm dead the next day. <laughs> I'm just, what pointers can you give us? If I had some, I'd give them to you. I mean, honestly, it is, it's... It is difficult. The one thing that does help is on the plane, they do have the, the lay down seats. So that is one thing that, that helps out. You can kind of try and get at least a few hours on the plane, but it's tough crossing time zones and everything like that. And um, I don't want to say jet lag, but that, certainly playing at different times of the night doesn't help. And going back and forth, like, you know, we just came from Chicago for the one day and now we're back here. So I, I would say you get used to it, but it is, you know, that's, that's why it's the grind of a season. It's, it's that type of stuff. I know at 1.30, when this is done, I'm going to take a nap. So, All right. <laughs> so join. right now, Peter, yeah, you got the next question. Thanks. Tommy, we're so excited to have you here. Thank you. Uh, could you talk a little bit about what it's like to play next to Andrelton Simmons? He's, in my opinion, the best shortstop in baseball. He's amazing. What's it like? He makes everyone around him better. I was actually lucky enough to play with uh, Andrelton in Atlanta, too. Um, my rookie season, he was there. We came up uh, in the Braves organization together. Um, he's the best, like you said. And um, he's the captain of the infield. He's always thinking two plays ahead of the other team. Um, yeah, he's, he's a weapon on defense. And I don't know how many guys you can really look at and say, like, he's, he's a weapon on defense, but he is. All right, Paul, your question. Thanks. Hope you're looking forward to your first All-Star game this year, <laughs> next month. <laughs> Thank you. But I wonder what your take is on some of the rule changes baseball has coming out there in terms of speeding up the game. And, uh, you can go through some of those and kind of what your opinion is on that as someone who's been in the game for a long time. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I don't know. I think, I think if you have something that is, uh, you know, the entertainment's there, you're not necessarily in such a rush to speed it up and get it over with. So I think that's something that could be addressed. As far as, like, the, the pitch clocks and everything like that, I don't really have too big an issue with it. I think, you know, if that's going to help shave some minutes off, so be it. But um, I know some guys, like the pitchers and stuff, have had some issues with it. But um, I think there's other, other ways that, that we can kind of be looking into, um, you know, pace of play type of stuff. I think if you look at tennis, you know, because you, you got to draw comparisons to stuff that doesn't have a time on it. And tennis is the only other sport, really. They don't really have an issue drawing attendance and fans and stuff like that. Um, so I think there's some stuff that can be taken from their sport that might be incorporated into our sport that might help, but I think that's probably a ways off. All right, we have time for two more questions. His question, anybody else, uh, if you have a question, please come on over here. Right now, Tim, what's your question? Thank you. Congrats on the great season, Tommy. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm, I'm curious if you have any comments on the way this game seems to have evolved, where 
I remember when I was a kid, if, if you had a runner on first and second, no outs, you'd automatically bunt. And I, I, it doesn't seem to be that way anymore. You're not, you're not bunting the runner over. You're not, it doesn't seem to even be as many stolen bases. And just the strategy of the game seems to have, have kind of evolved since when I was a kid. And I wonder if you have any questions, uh, comments on that. Yeah, I, it, it's definitely different. Um, now the approach is kind of, uh, you know, sit back and wait for the three-run home run, assuming that it's going to come eventually. Um, so don't give up outs on the bases and don't give up outs bunting the ball. So it's, it's definitely different. Um, I think that kind of lends itself to a little bit of an issue as far as, like, fan engagement and the action in the game because there's really not a whole lot of it when you're playing by that logic. And I, I get it. It's all based on probability that you don't want to give away um, outs. And if everybody's swinging for the three-run home run, probability says eventually you'll run into it and then it's worth three points instead of one point. I get it. But at the same time, um, it does detract from from certain aspects of the game that A, we're all accustomed to seeing, and B, we're a part of the game for a long time because there's some validity in it. It's not just, you know, it wasn't just there by mistake. Um, so if I'm being honest, I would like to see a little bit of kind of like a hybridization of it where you could have this approach where there are certain guys who bang the ball over the fence and then you have guys who are um, paid for moving runners and going first to third and stealing bases and stuff like that because that's as much part of the game as hitting home runs. All right, we have time for the final question right now. Mark, uh, what's your question? Actually, it's more of a thank you. Uh, born and raised in Chicago, sat there watching the Cubs games with my grandfather daily, uh, even listening to games on the radio. Uh, for you guys to bring home that World Series and uh, the magic that you brought to that team, Tommy, when you played for the team, I just wanted to thank you. My father, who just turned 83, got to see his first World Series victory uh, there in Chicago, and I just wanted to thank you. It's amazing. Thank you, guys. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure, Tommy, to have you here. And, of course, as always, Mr. Mead, uh, we're going to be doing our raffle. And we always have the player up there uh, pull the raffle ticket, so they're going to be bringing them over right now, if you don't mind. Uh, we're going to be raffling off two items. So we're going to do two raffle items. Tommy, if you don't mind, we're going to ask you to pull the ticket. Tim Mead's going to uh, announce the winner. I can see it's uh, 778909. 778909. Those are angel tickets she just won. Congratulations. <laughs> And one more ticket, if you don't mind, Tommy Lustella. Congrats. <laughs> 778839. That's the same table, it's a fix. And you just won a signed pool house ball. Congratulations. All right, so congratulations to the raffle winners. In just a moment, uh, those two gentlemen right there are going to be stepping down behind the curtain. We would ask everybody to be able to take an opportunity to get in line. We're going to be a little bit limited in time because it is a game day, and uh, we got to get him down to the clubhouse. But they're going to be taking an opportunity to uh, take some pictures with you guys. But first, normally we go right to that. But we're going to ask you two gentlemen to stay right there. And Tommy Listella, you get to also be a part of a special recognition right now. Ladies and gentlemen, for Mr. Tim Mead, I introduce to you presenting this special recognition once again, the OC Forum President, Paul Stover. Thank you, Devin. Uh, let's give another round of applause to Tim Mead and Angels Baseball. And thank you, Tommy. Really great to have you here. And I hope you have the best season yet to come here. You've been hitting it out of the park. I want to see more big flies. Thank you. So um, at this time, if um, you could just take a moment with me to say that before we conclude today's program, it's only fitting that we pause to say thanks to a truly great friend of the OC Forum. But more than that, a dedicated leader both on and off the field of baseball. So on behalf of the OC Forum, 
we would like to take a moment to say thanks to Tim Mead, Director of Communications for Angels Baseball for over 40 years. Tim, on behalf of the OC Forum, we congratulate you on being named the next president of the National Baseball Hall of Fame. As a long time rock of integrity in our community, Cooperstown is getting a great leader and an even greater person. You have led the Angels organization in a community conversation that always delivers honor and respect ahead of pretense and puffery. There is no doubt that you will continue the conversation in Cooperstown. We will greatly miss you in Orange County, but knowing we can visit you in Cooperstown along with Mantle, Ryan, Guerrero, and so many more, just means you are just on just one big fly away. Thanks for your incredible support of the OC Forum over the years as we recognize you today with this Certificate of Appreciation. Now, ladies and gentlemen, once again, we do want to say thank you for everybody being here. Uh, I do want to open it back up if, Mr. Stover, if you do have anything else you'd like to say. Just one last thing. Uh, once again, we thank Angels Baseball, all of our sponsors, all of you for being here today, our board members. Thank you for making these great conversations possible. But we do want to announce the next program, and this is a big deal. We want you there. We hope that you will join us this summer at our Building Communities of the Future. Building Communities of the Future, program with Five, Point, very, Five Point's very own Emil Haddad and many more on Thursday, August, August 22nd. Please be there. Thank you. Have a great OC day and go Angels. Yeah.